Amen. Good morning. You can have a seat. There you go. You're, you're there. You're coming. A little, a little delayed in the good morning. That's okay. I'm, I'm so excited to have you with us today. Am I on? Can you hear me? Okay. No. You're trying to hear Nate? No, I'm just kidding. All right. Uh, I'm on, so I did what I'm supposed to do. Okay. So, uh, this morning we're going to continue our series, What Does That Even Mean? I'm excited to, to share with you uh, what uh, we're going to talk about today. My name is Matt, I'm one of the pastors here. Pastor Mark is away with his family, just enjoying some time away. Uh, if you follow him on social media, they're uh, at their second home, which is Disney World. And uh, they just love to get down there, and so we're excited for them to have some time away of, of just refreshment and uh, uh, relaxation, hopefully, for them. So uh, we're going to talk about today, this morning, though, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but the, the word spirit-filled, like what does it mean, what does that even mean to be spirit-filled? Maybe you've been a part of, of the church for a while, and, and you've heard that word, but you're not sure if you're spirit-filled. We're going to clarify that today. Uh, but before we get into like the technical stuff and, and, and really dive into God's word this morning, I, I just want to ask you this question. Um, and I'm sure I'm alone in this question, so it's okay if you don't kind of resonate with it, but I'm pretty, pretty confident it's just me. Um, but do you, is there anything about you that you wish you could change? <laughs> right? Like, I'm completely alone in that. I, I, I can tell. Like, you don't, you, you're, you're good with who you are. Like, and not, not like physical things. Like, um, I'm an Adonis of a man. So, like, I don't, I'm not worried about that. But like habits, like things that you do that you wish you wouldn't do any longer. Um, for me, it's this. I, I am not an organizational person. Like I, 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 I like to think through things. I like to think through the details on some things. But when it comes to applying organization to my life, I am terrible at it. Maybe you're this type of person where um, you, you have like just a space where you can constantly put things down. For me... It's any space that is flat. So, like, I come home and, like, I put something down, like, on the counter. My mom used to get mad at me when I was a kid. She would just fuss. We had this long bar counter. As you came in the garage, there was just this, this bar height counter. And all three of us, my brother, my sister, and myself, we would just dump things there. My dad would just dump things there. And she'd get mad at us. But down at the end of the ca counter was the parents' space where they would dump things, too. So it's not my fault that I'm this way. It's their fault. Right. So like, I, like any level of service, I'll do that. My nightstand at my, at my house, I have this felt bowl thing that I got. I thought, this is going to help me be organized. It's a bowl to put my things in. And so I put my things in there, but now it's just like overflowing with old receipts. <laughs> as if I'm ever going to organize those receipts, right? Like when I go to restaurants now, if, if I have the option to not get a receipt, I don't want the receipt. Because what's going to happen is one of two things. It's going to go in my felt bowl. And then I'm going to have this mountain of receipts that I really just should have just thrown in the trash. Or it's going to stay in my pocket and I'm going to find it when I do laundry. And I'm not going to remember what it's for because all the ink got washed away. Right? So then I just have paper in my laundry and that's no good either. Well, so I'm so bad at organization. Here's, here's what happened in my office. It's a true story. A couple of months ago, I, we have a new assistant. Oh, she's been with us since uh, about July, so, so not very new. But um, her name is Loida, and she is a wonderfully organized person. God has built her for this. Comes into my office to ask me some questions, which she does most days. And um, she, she's, as she's leaving, she kind of hits her leg on a cardboard box I have right next to my door. And it's kind of blocking the door. And so she just turns to me and she says, Pastor. And she always says, Pastor. And she's so kind and just so polite. And, and it makes me feel weird. And because <laughs> nobody else calls me Pastor, but she does. And it's, I just, I so appreciate that. And, and so respectfully, she says, uh, Pastor, I'm, I'm going to fix this. <laughs> now, so my door is right here, my desk is here, and I had this box, and there's, there's papers piling up, and there's just things strewn about this long table thing that I have, and I just, I just fill it with stuff. It's not stuff that I need, it's just the stuff that I have, right? And, and so she says, I am pastor, I'm going to fix this. And I just laughed, and I just looked at her, I said, all right, Lloyda, because I'm not very good at this. Like, I need, I need you. To do that. So I just said, go for it. And she does. She, she came in. She organized it. The next day I came in. And it was beautiful. Just impeccable. She, she got this, this I don't know. I, I think I had it on my desk. This tray thing that she put things in to like keep it organized. I was like, where did that come from? 
but I'm pretty sure it was in my office somewhere uh, underneath all the papers that I keep and the receipts that I have. And so like all of these things, and it's just beautiful because she's made for that. And for me, it's like, I wish I could be more organized, but I'm just not very organized. It's just not something I have inside of me. But I, lo- I love to think through details and things like that, but when it comes to my life and application, i uh, just not a very detail-oriented person. You see, the thing is, we all have this behavior problem. Like, we all have these things in our lives where it's just like, I wish I could stop doing that, because I know if I did this rather than that, it would just be so much better. And, and, and this morning, what I want to tell you is this. There is hope for us who do the things we don't want to do or don't do the things we want to do. Because not only do we have this problem, but there's a guy in the Bible, his name is Paul. If you come from a Catholic background, his name was St. Paul. Like, this guy had this problem. Romans chapter 7. If you've got a copy of God's Word, we're going to go to Romans chapter 7. We're going to be at the end of Romans 7 and go into Romans 8. But here's what I need you to do. When I was a kid, I used to read other parts of the Bible because I tuned out the preacher. You are not allowed to tune out the preacher this morning. Okay? Because the stuff that's surrounding these two chapters is heavy, deep like stuff, and I need you to stick right here with me, okay? We're going to stay right here with Pastor Matt this morning, as Loretta refers to me, and you, we're going we're to go together through the scriptures. So no reading ahead, no reading behind. You're going to stay right here with me. Got it? Agreed? Okay, if not, deal with it. All right, so uh, Romans 7. Paul says this. He says, I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right... I inevitably do what is wrong. Principle of life. Paul, author of this letter that he's writing, author of most of the New Testament, guy who took the gospel from the city of Jerusalem to the known world. Paul says, I do what I don't want to do. And here's what he says. Look, look, he says this. I love God's law with all my heart. I love God's law with all my heart. I know what I should do is right. And I love what is right. But for whatever reason, he continues on. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. This is a problem for Paul. And if it's a problem for Paul, I'm a guarantee it's a problem for you. He says this, oh, what a miserable person I am. You ever feel that way? If I could just be organized, if Lloyda just wouldn't judge me for leaving all those papers out, if my wife would just just understand, I, I don't know why I do this. It's something deep inside of me that I can't solve. But I just, I leave my socks on the floor right next to the laundry basket. Like, I have to lay, this is why when I go to bed at night, I lay my clothes on the floor next to the bed. Why do I do that? Because it's too much work to have to go around the corner of the door of the closet where the laundry basket is. I don't know why I do this. I do it, but I, I'm a miserable person who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death. And I joke, like it's, I get it, like these things, this, if this is the extent of sin, like I'm good. But, but there are things, like there's deeper things inside of us, right? We, we all identify with these things. If I need this freedom, who's going to free me from it? Who's going to help me to be better? Paul says the hope is this. It's Jesus. Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see how it is in my mind, right? I really want to obey God's law. In my mind, I don't want to think thoughts that I shouldn't think, right? I don't want to, I don't want to objectify women. In my mind, I don't want to feel the compulsion to lie when people ask me, how is my life going? 
In my mind, I don't want to view other people as less than me. In my mind, I want to treat my wife with, with love and gentleness. In my mind, I want to respect my husband. In my mind, I want to be a good father, a good mother. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. I don't know why I lay my clothes on the floor and, and my receipts just end up in my felt bowl and, and, and Lloyd has to come in and, and, and reorganize my desk because for the life of me, I can't do it for myself. Well, I do know why. Because I am a slave to sin. You see, this, this idea is that there's this, there's this law, this, this power. He talks about how we are under this power, right? And this power is, is like a law. Not the law like... Um, I'm going to do the right thing, right? Like, don't lie, don't steal, don't speed, all the, like, those are laws. But there is this, there's this, this idea of a law being this governing force, this governing power, right? Like the, like the laws of thermodynamics. I'm not even going to pretend to know what that means. But there are laws, right? The laws of physics. We know these things, like, like Sir Isaac Newton discovered these things about nature and how this world works, that for every action, there's an e equal and opposite reaction, right? Like, these things are true, and these things happen. Well, there's this law, this power, this thing inside of us that leads us to sin and death. That's what this force does. The Bible calls it sin. And it leads towards death. So no matter how hard we try, like, if I try to be more organized, inevitably what I'm going to do is I'm going to slip up and I'm going to fall and, and it's just going to fail. And, and if I try to be a more um, um, calm and gentle person and I continue to try to do that, and I do, it's just, I'm going to end up failing and falling to death. And it, it affects everything in our lives and pushes it towards death. That's what the effect of sin is. And Paul says... That the, the freedom from this, the answer for this, is found in our Lord Jesus Christ. He continues on and he says this in Romans 8.1. He says this, So there is now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. So here's, here's what this means. No matter how much you fail or feel like a failure, no matter how this sin shows up in your life and you just continue to mess up and mess up, and no matter how hard the fight is, you are not condemned because of Jesus Christ. That if you have made Jesus your Lord and your Savior, if you have trusted in his death, burial, and resurrection, and have proclaimed that he is the one that you are living your life for, that you're going to do as he asks you to do, then there is no condemnation for you. Meaning this, there's no judgment against you. No matter how, you're not a failure. You are not labeled failure. You are labeled forgiven. And so as we go through this, there's no condemnation for us, but it doesn't mean that we won't struggle and fail. He continues on in verse 2, And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. This word power, that law. There is a force. The life-giving spirit is this force that leads us towards life. In the same way that sin is a law, a power that ultimately reserve, that ends in death, the spirit is a power that ultimately ends in life. And the only way to, to reverse the effects of sin and death is to have the Holy Spirit. And he says this, that if you belong to him, you have this power because it has freed you from the power of sin and death. This is a, this is a promise from Jesus. He continues on, the law of Moses, and we have to understand this, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So what he's saying is this, even though we know what we should do, we know it, we can't do it because of the sinful nature. No matter how much you know, you should not lie. You will lie. 
No matter how much you know, you should honor your mother and father. Kids, you will not do that. Inevitably. No, no, no matter how much you know, I should not commit adultery. You're going to think adulterous thoughts. No matter how much you know, I should not covet my neighbor's wife. You're going to ultimately think those things. You're going to think somebody else has a better spouse. Somebody has a better life. Somebody's grass is greener than yours, and you want it. Because that's how we're made. We have this sinful nature, this force inside of us that is moving us towards death. But... God has given us Jesus. So God did what the law could not do. The law could never save you. But here's what he did. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. Skin and bones and muscle and cravings and desires for sugar and salt and fat. Right? Jesus knew it. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us. You hear this. In Jesus' body, God says, no more does sin have to reign and rule in you. It's not that it won't, but it doesn't have to. He did this by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He put to death our physical bodies in Jesus and the power of sin over our physical bodies. He put it to death in Jesus' sacrifice. So he did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully set aside for us. So all of the you shall nots and you should and all those things, Jesus fully satisfied them for you. And that's why there's no condemnation for you. He did this for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. So all the way in verse 1, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And those who are in Christ Jesus follow the Spirit. And this is where the application comes in. This is where it changes everything. You see, by the Holy Spirit, who was given to us by Jesus, we have help. Jesus, in John chapter 16, he's, he's leaving the upper room, and, and Judas has betrayed him. And if you've ever heard these stories, between that time and the time that Jesus is arrested, they take a journey from the upper room to the garden where Jesus is going to be arrested. And as they're walking, Jesus is pouring out just every last-minute advice he can because he knows his time is short. And what he says to them is this in John chapter 16. He says, I am sending my spirit to you. And he uses this word. I am sending a helper. A helper. Someone who will be with you even though I physically will not be with you. And that helper is the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus has fulfilled this promise, and he sent us the Holy Spirit. And if we are in Christ Jesus, then we should be living, following the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't happen that simply. But we have a help. And so we know what it's like to be controlled by our sinful nature. Like, you get it. Like, you get the cravings for, like, the selfish things that you want. Like, oh, man, I love. So here's the thing. I need to make a confession. Like, Mark, he's at Disney World right now, right? They're having a great time. I love Disney World too. And if I could go to Disney World and not work, I would do it. <laughs> In a heartbeat. And I know many of you think, like, pastors don't even have real jobs. You don't even begin to comprehend what it's like to be in ministry. And I'm not being a martyr, but I'm just saying, if it's between Mickey Mouse and Cornerstone Church, I would choose Mickey Mouse. That's my sin nature. And I would love to, I would just love to be there with them. And in a couple weeks I'm going. So, like, it's okay. <laughs> but that's how I feel. And you, you have those feelings. You're like, oh man, if I could just have like 500 more square feet on my house. If I could just have an extra bedroom. If I could just have the covered porch like so-and-so has down the street. Oh man. Oh man, if, oh, man, if, I, if, if I just had so-and-so's wife... If I just had this relationship in my life. 
If I had this dollar amount in my bank account or in my stocks or my portfolio, we all have these things inside of us that tell us life will be better if we achieve those things. And I'm just telling you, it's a lie. Oh, man, it's a lie. I love Disney World, but it's expensive. And my life is not better off when I blow all my money at Disney World. It's just not. And I don't have an endless supply of money yet. <laughs> Probably never. But that thing will not fulfill my life. So we know what it's like to be controlled by the sinful nature. And so Paul, in verse 9, he begins to tell us what it's like to live controlled by the Spirit. He says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature, those who are in Christ Jesus. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And here's this caveat for this thing. He puts it in parentheses. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. So here's the thing. If you have the Spirit of Christ inside of you, if you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, then you should be following the Holy Spirit. And if you have believed and trusted in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. Because if you don't, then you ain't saved. No spirit means no life. The spirit is the only thing that produces life inside of us. So if you don't have new life, you don't have the Holy Spirit. And if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you ain't following the Holy Spirit. And you are controlled by your sinful nature. It's not this thing where, like, I can believe in Jesus and live the life I want to, be, to live. I can trust in Jesus and still live in my sinful nature. They don't go together. It's like oil and water. They don't mix. Remember, those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. He continues, and Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. So at this, at this moment of believing, and maybe you're here this morning and you're like, you know what, my life just, it's not full. It's missing something. Maybe you, what you're missing is that you think you know Jesus, but you don't have the Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit, you don't know Jesus. He continues on. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living inside of you. He will give your mortal bodies life. Can you show that, that next part of that verse? He will give your mortal <laughs> bodies by this same Spirit life. He'll give it to you. So here's the thing, if you're trusting in Jesus that at the end of your life you're going to live forever, guess what? That's what you need, but if you don't have the Spirit of God living inside of you right now, if you're not seeing the Holy Spirit living in your life, if you're not following the Holy Spirit right now, there's no reason to trust that one day your spirit will have life like this. But if the Holy Spirit is living inside of you and you are spirit-filled today, you will have life and you can't separate the two. So here's the thing, if you've trusted in Jesus, you have this. You have this. By the Spirit of God, we have life-giving power over our sinful nature. Trust in that. Know that this morning, that, that there's no reason to believe that death will continue to reign in you, but that there is a Spirit working inside of you and desires to work inside of you, and you just got to figure out how to let Him have His way so that you can begin to have life. Because I, I really believe this. There are many Christians, many of us, who are struggling to try to live kind of both and right? Like one foot still in our sinful nature, still in the old ways that we want to live. And the other foot, we really want this Jesus giving life, but we just won't let go of this thing. And, and we're stuck and we're living this, this double life and it's really no life at all. Because ultimately what's going to happen is this life is going to give way into a chasm that's called death and you're going to fall into it. You need to have both feet planted in the, in the life that God has given to you. And that life comes through the life-giving spirit who lives inside of you. By the Holy Spirit, you have life-giving power over your sinful nature. You don't have to continue to do the things that you've always done. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, 
You have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do, for if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if the power of the Spirit, if through the power of the Holy Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. And so what it looks like is this, as the Spirit reigns inside of you and He's living inside of you, death comes to the things that cause your death. And you put to death the power of sin in your life so that you can have life. And what Jesus called abundant life. John chapter 10, Jesus is talking about his sheep. And in John chapter 10, he talks about Satan, the devil. And the devil, he says, is the thief. And the thief comes only to do three things. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. Why? It's because from the very beginning, the devil, this is what he has lived for. The devil exists only for one reason, and that is to stand in opposition to all that God is doing. And so when he is able to lead us away from God, no matter what that looks like, even if it's just stopping us in our tracks from having this spirit-filled life, he's doing what he set out to do. And so when your sinful nature wins out, the devil loves it. He loves it. But the way that God has answered this is through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we have to realize this, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can live differently. And so it's, it's not a question of this. Even every believer, I want to tell you this, every believer, every believer has the Holy Spirit. Because if you have trusted in Jesus and you have believed in Jesus, then he's given you his Holy Spirit. He promised it, and you can't have life in Jesus without it. And so if you trusted in him as your Lord and Savior, then you have the Holy Spirit. But there's a difference between whether you are spirit-filled and whether you live spirit-filled. And for many of us, we don't understand that we are spirit-filled and we are not living spirit-filled lives. And here's the thing. Living in your own power, you will never realize your full potential. Living in your own power, you will never realize your full potential. You will never realize all that God has for you. Because here's the thing, you're so blinded by your own hopes and dreams and desires that you can't see all that God has for you. You need God to open and take away your old dreams and your old desires and to take off that lens of sin and give you the lens of the Holy Spirit so that you can see what He is doing in your life and what He is doing in the lives of others around you. What He is only able to do if you want to have what Jesus called a rich and satisfying life, remember, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus responded, he said, but I came that they may have life, and life abundantly. In the New Living Translation, it says this, I came that they may have a rich and satisfying life. How many of us grew up with this understanding that the life that Jesus wanted for us was this drab, drudgery and not doing the wrong thing all the time. But that's not what Jesus is saying. He says, I came to give you a rich and satisfying life, a life that is full and it is abundant, but it is full and it is abundant of the things of God. And so if you are only seeing what you want to see, you'll get what only you can see, but it will never be as full or rich or satisfying as the life that God has for you and the potential that you have living a life that honors God is greater than any potential you can have anywhere else. God can do so much more with what you have than you can even begin to imagine or believe. Living in your own power, you will never do what pleases God. Never. The sinful nature can't please God. Remember, the law tells us what are the things that please God, and the sinful nature can't do those things. So when we love somebody, we want to do the things that please him. But if you live in your own power, you will never please God. Never. Inevitably, you might do it one time or two times, but then it's like, oh, I just messed that up, or you'll give up, or whatever. There's all kinds of things that are keeping you away from it. Why? Because the sin nature pulls us towards death. So eventually we're going to end up back there. Living in my own power, I will only produce what sin can produce, and that's death. That's all you get. 
You may build up the biggest stack of fame and fortune and bills and, and, and self-centered happiness and all these things. You may feel like, oh man, my life has been so great. And this big old mountain of what you've done will be swallowed up by the chasm that is sin and death. And it will amount to nothing. But, there's this big but that I want you to, to see and I want you to understand it. I ask for this but to be really big because this is really important. But, living, spirit-filled, I will do more than I can dream or imagine. Living spirit-filled, God takes over and he begins to put to death the personal goals and desires that I have, and he begins to open my eyes to what only he can do and to see what only I can see through him. And if you live spirit-filled, you will do more than you can dream or imagine. Jesus told us this. He said this. He said, look, I've done these really cool things. Think about all the cool things Jesus did. Uh, he brought Lazarus back to life. He fed 5,000 people, and then he fed 4,000 people, and then he walked on the water, and he, and, he, and he turned water into wine. He did all these wonderful things. And Jesus says, you will do greater things in my name. Think about this. When was the last time you walked on water? When was the last time you fed 5,000 people? When was the last time you saw somebody raised from the dead? But Jesus, the one who did all these things, oh, and by the way, came back to life himself, says you will do greater things. Why? Because the impact that the church has is greater than the impact that Jesus had in his earthly ministry. The greatest thing Jesus ever did was he invested in 12 people. 12 people! And one of them turned away from him. But those 12 people turned around and they took what Jesus did and it turned into a movement. And guess what? We get to be a part of this greater thing that Jesus is doing. So yeah, you may never walk on water and you may not be raising people from the dead and you may not feed 5,000 people, but you will do more than Jesus was able to accomplish here in his ministry because you will have the power of the Holy Spirit working inside of you and together we will see God do great things. Living in my own power, excuse me, living spirit-filled, I got confused in my notes, I will do what pleases God. Because, because if the Spirit is producing life in me, then I'm going to do the things that the Spirit wants me to do. You know what we call those things? The fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, Paul talks about, he says, this is what the desires of the flesh produce, and it's all these really bad things. But then he says, the Holy Spirit produces this fruit in our lives. It's love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and the one I hate the most, self-control. So that, so that when we want to do something that we know we ought to do, but we're tempted to do the other thing, like when, when it's lunchtime and you're hungry and, and you want to have the cheeseburger and fries, right? Like God can have victory over that insignificant thing so that later on you can have self-control that leads you to the great things that he has for you. Nothing is insignificant in God's life and in the lives of God's people. Like he cares that you're making bad choices about what we eat. He cares that I only like seem to eat french fries at every meal. He cares about that. Why? Because he wants to do an incredible work in us. And if, if, if I live spirit-filled, I will do what pleases God. And here's the last thing. Living spirit-filled, the spirit will produce life in me. I hear this out. Like, You've got areas in your life where death is reigning. You've got failed relationships. You've got marriage issues. You've got struggles and strains with your kids. You've got work problems with your coworkers. You've got all of these things going on. You've got neighbors that you avoid, like the plague. Like you, you go outside and, and that neighbor comes out of their house and all of a sudden you're super interested in your bushes. <laughs> I just, my attention cannot be broken right now. I really think I need to examine the pH level of the soil. I wonder if my water's too acidic. Right? Like, you, all of a sudden, you have an expertise in botany because your neighbor came outside because you want to avoid them. That's death reigning in your life. And by the Holy Spirit, He will produce life in you so that your heart is no longer turned against people, but for people. Why? Because God is doing a great work in us through the Holy Spirit where He wants to bring life where death reigns. 
And the only way for that to happen is for the Holy Spirit to work in you in such a way that the Holy Spirit is able to work in your friends, family, and neighbors. And it changes the world. You see, the difference, we have to recognize this. It's not whether you are spirit-filled. If you've believed in Jesus, and you call yourself Christian, you are spirit-filled. I'm not here to tell you you don't have salvation. I'm here to tell you your salvation is way more than you ever counted on it being. It's not whether you are spirit-filled, but are you living spirit-filled? Because to live spirit-filled means to tap into the same power that brought Christ back from the grave. And for that power to reign inside of you. Think about this. The same power that brought Christ back from the dead lives inside of you. The same power that created the heavens and the earth when God spoke it into existence, that same power lives inside of you. That when Jesus was in that grave and he's laid out in his tomb and his body is dead and lifeless and nothing's happening, all of a sudden, he starts to take breath. Think about that. And then think about this, that the same power, once Jesus came back to life and he sits up and he's ready to come out of that grave, and it busts that tomb open and tosses that rock away from the grave, that same power lives inside of you if you belong to Christ Jesus. Now think about this. Are you seeing that same power evident in your life? That's the problem. It's not whether you are spirit-filled. It's whether you're living a spirit-filled life. Change has to happen. The first thing that we have to do is this. These are just things that I've found true in my own life. There's like no, I don't have scriptural reference for it or anything like that, but I really believe that this is how God begins to work. You have to release yourself from old habits. Here's the thing. If you continue to do the things that you used to do or have always done, like you met Jesus, but you just continue to live the way you used to live, to continue to do the same things over and over again and expect a different result is the definition for insanity. Like if you expect to be someone who people would look to and they'd find life through them because the Holy Spirit is living in their lives, but you're doing the things that you've always done, you're insane. You're just insane. That's okay. There's a lot of insane people out there. You're not alone in that. But if you allow the Holy Spirit, because you know God's word and you hear the word of God, says, I got to live differently. I can't live according to my sinful nature. I got to live according to the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. So men, if you have this issue, you have this struggle with pornography. And I'm just, I'm bringing it up because nine out of 10 American men or whatever, that's just a stat I'm making up. But most of us have had a problem with pornography at some point in our lives. And so to say that we're sitting in this church and 9 out of 10 of us have, have had this issue with pornography and to act like if we haven't changed our old habits, that somehow we're different? That somehow God is having victory in our lives? Absolutely not. If you know that if I'm awake after everybody's gone to bed and I have access to the computer or I have access to the television or whatever it is, and I'm going to do, that's when I would normally get, break that habit. Some of you may need to just throw the computer away. You may need to throw the smartphone away. Maybe you need to go back to the flip phone. I hear Motorola's bringing the razor back out. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> go get one. Like, you need to just break the habits that lead to the temptation. You can't expect to bathe in the mud and come out clean. You can't break the old habits. If you know I'm not going to eat healthy, like God wants me really to live healthy, and for me, it's like I keep going to places where it's like, I know I'm going to order the wrong thing, God. Like, I just do that. When the waitress comes and she says, what would you like to drink? And you have just this impulse, like compulsion response, Coke. <laughs> like, you don't even think about it. I'll take a Coke. I'll take a sweet tea. Whatever. you got to break the old habits, right? you got to start asking for water. you got to be conscious in that moment. you got to say, I'm going to be clear-headed, and I'm going to think through what I'm going to drink today. If you continually treat, continually treat your wife disrespectfully and don't understand why she doesn't seem to love you anymore, if you continue to berate and nag your husband and don't quite understand why he doesn't love you, if you continually uh, are hard on your children and don't treat them as someone that you care about and they don't understand why they don't like you, 
You've got to break the old habits. You've got to allow the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit to change you in such a way that he produces life in all the areas of your life. You've got to release yourself from these old habits. Second, you've got to realize the power that you possess. Realize the power that you possess. The same power that brought Christ from the dead lives inside of you. And if that power can bring a dead man back to life, it can bring life to you. Why? Because Jesus has guaranteed it, and Paul has encouraged us in Romans 8 about it. Second, you gotta res- or third, you've got to respond to the Spirit's leading. Here's the thing. You can't just know what you've got to do. You've got to trust that you should be doing it. You've got to realize, like, oh, this is the Holy Spirit speaking to me right now. It's not like Pinocchio, right, and Jiminy Cricket. And always let your conscience be your guide. Like, you're not going to have a song in your head. The Holy Spirit doesn't do that. But the Holy Spirit will begin to use what's inside of you and the knowledge of reading of Scripture and the, the wisdom of other believers in your life to push you in the right direction. Sometimes it's avoid this place at all costs, right? Like if you have a struggle with addiction and you're walking into the ABC store, the Holy Spirit might just say, hey, buddy, not a good idea. But sometimes it's going to be the wisdom to know this doesn't line up with what Jesus says. And I got to respond to what Jesus says. The Holy Spirit will help you to do that. And then finally, you got to recognize the difference. Because sometimes, sometimes we don't recognize that, that God is doing something in our lives. But when we recognize the difference, it allows us to celebrate what God has had for us. When we recognize the difference that, that's being made in our lives, we can celebrate that. And that celebration produces, that's life, right? What happens every year on, the year on the day that you were born? What do we do? We celebrate, right? That's pretty cool. Life happened umpteen years ago. I'm going to be 37 this year, 2020. And on my t- March 24th, 2020, We're going to celebrate that 37 years ago, life happened. That's awesome. So why not celebrate the times where life is happening in your life and recognizing that God is producing life in you? It'll encourage you. It'll build you up. It'll keep you going for the next moment where you realize, you know what? This change in my life, I'm seeing how I'm becoming generous. Why? Because I chose to give. And as I choose to give more and more and more, the more life is produced in me and the more generosity becomes a part of my life. And as I choose to be loving, the more love I start to see in my life, the more love I get out of my relationships and the more love I'm giving to other people and it produces life. And the more joy that I have in my life, the more joy I start to see in other people. And, and I don't run away from my neighbor because I want to avoid them because they suck the life out of me when they talk together. The joy that God has for you in the Holy Spirit is greater than your neighbor going on and on about their life's problems. And one day, you're going to have the opportunity to say, I used to have those problems too. But let me tell you about what God has done. And that is so much bigger than your stock portfolio, the size of your house, the cars you drive, the clothes you wear. Hey, I got this shirt. I got this shirt. Buy one, get two free at Belk. You don't know that. You thought I paid full price. (laughs) But I paid a third. God will do an incredible work in us if we just release ourselves to the Holy Spirit. So today, you've got to walk away with this. If you've, you may have been sitting here and you're like, "I, I don't really identify with a lot of this stuff. Like, I get it. And you may be at a point in your life where you're just like, you know what, it just feels like there's just death all the time. I want to ask you the question, have you given yourself to Jesus. And what that means is this, that you have made this decision in your life that I'm going to live as though Jesus 
is in, in control of my life. And the first thing that that means is this, that I believe because the same power that did what you say you believe lives inside of you. So you have to believe that Jesus died, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day. And when you believe in that, then you choose to say, because of that power, I'm going to trust my life to Jesus. And so this morning, if you have not made that decision to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, I want to encourage you to do that. I'm going to be available. There's going to be people at our prayer, uh, uh, our prayer team's going to be at the corners of the room, the back corners. They would love to talk with you. I'm going to be available at the back of the room in the middle to talk with you. You cannot leave today without beginning that relationship with Jesus, trusting in him. Because the same power that brought him back from the dead is what he gives to us and is what's going to make you able to live a life that pleases God and satisfying and rich and full and all those things. You need the Holy Spirit to be active in your life. If you've believed in Jesus before and you just don't see the Holy Spirit power in you, then I would ask you this. Are you living as though you're spirit-filled? Where are you placing your trust and your faith? And you need to get that straight as well. And then today, look, if if you're just at a point where it's like, I I don't know what I should do, I want to encourage you, stop by, talk to our prayer team. Have them pray over you because the same power that's working in them is going to work in you. They pray over you and God is faithful to answer the prayers of his people. And so if at the very least, all you need is somebody to pray for you so that you would understand the life that you could have in Jesus, then we want that to happen today. I want to invite you to just stand up. I want to pray over you. And then we're just going to sing the praises of our God and King this morning. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your gospel, for the good news that we have in Jesus Christ, that you sent him in a physical body like ours, understanding all of the temptations and problems that we have. You sent Jesus to put an end to the reign of sin in our lives. Sin no longer holds us but the power of the life-giving spirit lives inside of us. And so today, God, I pray for those that maybe have never trusted in Jesus and all they know in their life is death. I pray that they would see the life that they may have in Jesus, that you would make them alive through your Holy Spirit today. I pray, God, that you would, for those of us that have been living our lives, if we're just not living spirit-filled lives, I pray that you would convict us, God, of that. Make it real to us, but God, lead us to a place where we will be obedient to the Spirit's leading, that we will see, God, not that we need to keep the rules, but we will see love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control just so evident in our lives because we're living after the Spirit. Allow us to release the old habits. Allow us to recognize the power that we possess in Jesus. And allow us, God, to see the difference and celebrate it in our lives so that others might find life in you. You are good. You have given us all that we need. We praise you and thank you, Lord Jesus. In his name we pray.